Hey everyone, welcome back to the show. I'm excited for my guest today. Her name is Sarah Boyd. Sarah is an authority on resilience, courage, and creativity. I would like to be an authority on all those things too. She holds a master's in educational psychology and a diploma of neuroscience of leadership. Sarah has a deeply personal experience in navigating stressful life events such as cancer and chronic health conditions while building and running successful businesses in America and, and Australia. She's the founder of Resilient Little Hearts Children's Publishing House and a children's book author. She is passionate about lifting the limits off an individual's potential so they can pursue their dreams and live a meaningful life. So welcome, Sarah Boyd. Thank you so much, Karen. I'm so excited to be here with you today. Yeah, don't be fooled by her accent. She may be Australian, but she's down in the sunny California. We were just talking. I've, I've just moved. I don't even know if I can claim Aussie anymore. I think my Aussie friends are saying your accent's starting to shift a little bit. But oh, I, really? I, I want to keep it. Yes. <laughs> I lived in the States for two years, and when I came home, everybody told me that I sounded American, and I got it for years afterwards. Oh, wow. What? I don't, you don't notice it, right? Yes, not at all. Yeah, no, I don't notice that. So I think you sound still very Australian. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I'll take that compliment. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to just start off with a little blurb from your blog, actually, that yeah. I just thought was so great. Although the specifics of our stories may be different, one thing I have learned is pain is pain. No matter how it comes into our lives, it knocks the wind out of you. As a society, we're not taught how to deal with pain. So the only thing we know to do is to run away from it. But I've discovered the power of facing our pain because of what, what I've gone through. I believe that there's beauty, meaning, and hope, and even, in dark, even in dark places. Mm. Oh, see, it gives me shivers just reading that. <laughs> oh, very cool. So can you just start out just telling us about this dark place that you went through? Yeah, for sure. So, <coughs> excuse me, my voice is going a little bit as well. Um, I was probably, I was in my early 20s is kind of where my story starts. And my husband and I, who run a business together, um, we were <clears throat> running a business that was basically public speaking and and running training programs in organizations. And one of the training programs that I would run was a resilience program. And so we would come in and we would teach um, people who are working in corporates, if they're going through major changes, we would teach them mindset and emotional coping mechanisms um, to how to cope with life. And that was from my psychology background. I found that very fulfilling. And um, so many of these 40, 50, 60 year olds would come up to me with tears in their eyes at the end of the training and say, I just wish that I knew this stuff earlier because it was so life changing. But it wasn't really until I went through my own um, really deeply personal experience that I realized how important these conversations around pain and resilience really are. And that was when I was 27 years old. Um, I got a phone call. It was early one Friday morning in November and I got a phone call from my specialist who I had seen weeks before on a completely unrelated issue and he called me out of the blue and he said to me, Sarah, I'm clearing my schedule. You need to come in immediately. Um, your results have come back as suspicious. And while I was seeing him on other unrelated things, he had noticed a lump on my neck um, and said, oh, that looks quite large. And uh, I didn't even know I had a lump. Like, that's how naive I was. I was like, isn't that just your neck? Like, yeah, right. Uh, anyway, he'd sent me to a biopsy and I really literally had thought nothing of it. And so a few hours later, I'm sitting in his office and, and he kept saying this was like, the results are suspicious. We might have to do something. And I kept asking, like, what does that even mean? Like, I literally didn't understand what that meant. And then he said the word cancer. And like for me at that moment, it happened like it did in, in the movies. Like I felt like everyone else's voices become, became muffled and I started feeling like in this head spin of like, I'm 27 years old. This stuff doesn't happen to me. Like if this stuff was going to happen, this stuff happens like way later on in life. Like I haven't had kids. I'm like, you know, still very ambitious. And it threw me into this um, almost quarter life crisis emotionally and I went through a time period where I had to have two, two separate surgeries. They um, 
completely removed my thyroid. It ended up being thyroid cancer. I had a, a rarer form, not the normal form. So it was growing aggressively. It was starting to show signs of spreading. I had two separate times of radiation. Um, and because of all of the different things and the hormones related, I had huge fatigue. Very luckily, I, I didn't have to go through chemo. Um, but I just had this huge fatigue. And so really for 12 to 18 months, my whole life was on hold. And I went from being like this highly driven, very ambitious, you know, want to conquer the world personality woman to lying in bed at home or in hospital, like having no energy, being able to do anything and really emotionally going through this place of like, what is my life? Like, what is my life come to? And, and also I think because it was cancer and I was very lucky they caught it and, you know, it was never going to be at the point where it was like a threat to my life. But I think that just the diagnosis process show, so shook me that at any moment, you know, yeah. like I just really, it just really shook me that at any moment something major could happen in your life and this, the rest of your life isn't promised to you. And so I, that in retrospect was a huge gift because being confronted with your mortality at that age really makes you become very heightened to what's really important and meaningful in life. And so I went through this whole journey of not just physically recovering from something, which I'm very grateful. I'm seven years cancer free and all reports are clear, but I'm on the other side of that experience. I'm so grateful for it because it taught me so many things and developed so much in me that if I hadn't gone through that, not that I would wish it on anyone, it really wouldn't be the woman that I am today. And so that's what I mean when I say there's beauty, meaning and hope even in dark places, because there's something about pain and going through something hard that brings such definition of purpose and the sense of awareness into your life that really doesn't come any other way. And we can talk about it with, you know, all other people. But I, I think if you're in a season of your life where you're going through pain, no matter what that's been caused by physical or emotional pain, um, there's a gift in there if you can keep holding on and looking for it. Yeah, I agree. At what point, I mean, you obviously, like you said, you're in a dark place. And it's, it's interesting too, because I went through my own, I didn't have cancer, but I actually had a crazy thyroid issue that happened to me where I had really high amounts of reverse T3 and same as you being this like super driven woman that I, I mean, I worked out, I, I worked every day, I could work long hours, no problem. And, and it started to creep up slowly and it got to the point that I couldn't get off my couch. I couldn't work out. I was super depressed and I was like, what is the matter with me? And it was months of that before, you know, things started to get better and I realized what was happening and got on the right medication. And yeah. it was like, same thing. I had to be like, okay, why is this happening? But mm -hmm. in your own journey, what triggered that aha moment of realizing maybe there's something good in this? Because I mean, when you're in the depths of that kind of darkness and you think your life's at stake, it's really hard to be positive and upbeat and be like, oh, this is all happening for a reason. Yes. So was there something, someone, or was it just a gut, like intuitive thing that kind of came over you when you realized this is happening for a reason? Yeah. So, um, I do want to preface that the feeling that I have that it happened for a reason and the gift that it is happened way after the situation. Yeah, okay. And I didn't, I didn't feel like that in the situation. Mm -hmm. And, and I think that's important to know too, that when you've got friends that are going through something hard, like you, they do not want to hear like how it's happening for a reason. And I, I would have like wanted to headbutt you if you yeah. said that <laughs> during the time yeah. um, that I was going through it. I, I don't, um, I think I'm pretty naturally a mentally strong person, but I, what I am good at is always reframing. And it's, it's the thing of reframing is a mental capacity to finding something good, even in a bad situation. And so it wasn't, they weren't huge reframes. They weren't like, thank goodness that I've got cancer or something like that. But they were like, cause why would you say that? <laughs> they were really little. They were like, well, thank goodness. Like I, you know, I had this amazing doctor that found it, you know, like I would have gone on living thinking that everything was fine or thank goodness, like that treatment went well, or right. maybe I didn't feel as tired one day as I did another. And so the reframes were really small. And I think what's important too, is I had to, 
I was in a place of resistance for a long time to the, the process of even going through the treatment. Like I tried to keep working and I tried to like, I remember one time like showing up at work and my friend calling me and saying like, what are you doing? Like three days ago, you were in hospital, like go home. And, and it was at that point of like, I realized how much I was emotionally resisting facing what I was going through. And because of that, like I almost wasn't going through it. And it wasn't until I surrendered and went, and decided, you know what, I can't keep running at the same pace that I was. Um, I'm not going to allow cancer to be my whole life, but at the moment, like I actually need to rest, that I felt like um, I was able to kind of face it a lot more and process what was happening to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I like the word reframing. I always say change, I change my perception. The same, yes. same idea, right? Is we have, a lot of people don't realize this, we have the choice to how we want to frame something or how we want to perceive a situation. Yes. But we're so hardwired not to see that. <laughs> yes. Right? No, it's true because the more that you decide on something, the more you're going to find evidence of that thing. So I always use the example of like, if you're in the market for a new car and say you've got your heart set on a certain make and model and color, all of a sudden everywhere you look, you see that car all over the road. But if you, for example, weren't looking for that car, you don't see it as much. And so we, we do get very stuck in mental patterns of um, thinking and processing about something. And that's why a lot of the time, particularly in challenging situations, reframing has to be done intentionally and, and or it has to be done with the help of somebody else. And so intentionally may mean sitting down with a journal and asking yourself specific questions like how much is this situation going to matter in my life in five to 10 years or what's something small I can find that's good in a really hard situation um, or having a friend ask those kind of questions to you with, if you've given them permission to, because that's the other thing that comes along with pain that a lot of people don't understand is there's a layer of grief and grief is not something that has to be reframed. Grief is something that just has to be walked through. Mm. And so the grief of my naive youthhood, the grief of like life as I knew it has changed, the grief of watching all my friends still work really hard, start to have children, like their lives were moving forward while I felt like I was stuck in a stalling pattern. And so reframing doesn't work well during a time of grief. And it's really important to try and find your way through the grief before you kind of put pressure on yourself to reframe this into a positive situation because the grief will come in waves sometimes. Mm -hmm. So uh, now that you're on the other side of it and it's been this amount of time, what have you learned from being sick? What was the purpose, do you think? I think it's really interesting that you were somebody that taught other people how to be resilient. And then you got this like kaboom, like, yeah. okay, now you got to practice what you preach. Yeah. <laughs> right? It's like, annoying, isn't it? Yes, I it is. Somebody else. <laughs> um, so for me, um, my massive wake up call was um, I had, even though on the surface, I looked to everybody else, like I was living a quote unquote, very successful life. Um, you know, the truth is the work I was doing wasn't actually the work that I wanted to do. Mm. And I had felt for a very long time that I wanted to write, that I wanted to talk about these topics with women and help them have the courage and resilience to go after their own dreams. But I was so scared and, I'm, and I was so scared about other people's opinions and <clears throat> not even to the point that I could have even articulated that to you at the time. I literally was so scared that I wouldn't even admit it to myself that that's what I wanted to do. I kind of, it kind of sat in the back of my mind of like, oh, one day, like I might do something like that. And the gift of cancer in my life was that it, it put a kind of fire under me and made me realize like, I don't, my, my life is not guaranteed. This whole plan you have that you're telling yourself that maybe in 20 years time, you might start doing these things. Like, how do you know that's even going to happen, Sarah? <laughs> and, and that was the gift because I finally found something that was more scary than the fear of other people's opinions. And that was the regret of what if I get to the end of my life? And do you know what was crazy for me in being faced with my mortality? It was not 
whether or not I did the things, it was whether or not I had the courage to put myself in the game. Like, did you even try Mm -hmm. it? Sarah, right, right. you know, like, did you even try to do some of those things that had been put in your heart or did you just play it safe and, you know, stay in the box so that no one would ever say anything negative about you or maybe not like you or all that sort of stuff, just play the good girl. Um, and so that was the gift of cancer for me because if I hadn't had cancer at the time that I had it, I really don't know where I would be in my work that I really find so meaningful now in what I get to do. And, you know, the family that we've built with my husband and I like my life now is genuinely a result of a lot of the wake ups and revelations that I had during that season in my life. Wow. Thank you so much for sharing that. I'm sure so many people listening are going, oh, how I can relate to that. Because it's something that we all face that we're all afraid of. We are afraid to rock the boat. We're wired to stay in our comfort zone and not to shake the boat. And to, yeah. right, yes. it's, it's, it, Everything goes off in our brains even that tell us, don't, don't change. Don't do anything different. Keep yes. it the norm. Yes, absolutely. And we have such a logical side of our brain that's just like, well, this is working for you. Why would you change it? Or you studied for this and, you know, why would you do that? And especially too for me that a lot of the pursuits that I was feeling drawn to were more creative, more purpose-driven. They were less like, you know, corporate world, that kind of bottom line thing. And so, you know, the logical side would fight with my brain. But in the end, it really always came back to that question for me is like, what would I regret? Would I regret not giving this a go? Yeah. And interesting too, that it was your thyroid. Cause I'm, I used to do body work and I don't know if you believe in this kind of stuff, but every area of the body will signify a different emotion depending on what chakra it has to do with. Yeah. And the thyroid is your voice chakra. It's wow. the thing that you wanted to say and that you, you're not saying. Wow, right. isn't that amazing? Isn't that I amazing? I didn't know that. You yeah. didn't know that? I didn't know that. Yes. And so I always tell women, I'm like, this is your voice. Like if you've got thyroid problems, what are you not saying that you need to say? Yes. Maybe that's just to a person, a partner. But for you, it was in your career. You were yes. not speaking to the people you were wanting to speak to and about speaking about the stuff that you wanted to speak about, right? Yes, absolutely. And like, I just think there's, you know, I talk about resilience a lot. And for those of you listening, maybe haven't heard that term. It's basically what psychologists call our capacity to bounce back from stress. And in all the research they, they found, you know, for someone who struggles to bounce back from challenge or stress is when they often go on to develop like a mental illness or struggle Um, because of something that they went through and then people who are resilient are able to kind of bounce back without assistance in that way but in the research is really interesting about 50% of people who are classified as resilient have this um, what they've termed post-traumatic growth and so yeah it's really interesting in that their level of purpose and meaning and happiness in their life actually increases over time as a result of the negative experience they went through. So, you know, your, your daily level of fulfillment and purpose in your life, because of the negative experience, we all go through a dip. It's normal to feel negative about a negative situation. And I always say that to people, like, let's not, you know, criticize ourselves for being human. Because if you didn't feel negative about a negative situation, you'd be a sociopath. <laughs> right, yeah, right. So if you feel sad about a sad situation, like, good, you're a human good. being. Yeah. <laughs> if you feel angry about an unfair situation, good. Mm-hmm. Um, but after that time of processing, these individuals are able to come out. And, and same thing as what I'm sharing, they all look back on that and say, Do I wish it happened? No. Would I wish it on anyone else? No. But am I grateful for having gone through it? And is my my life now at a greater level of fulfillment? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I think if if we would all just just do that, like if we would all just take that pain or that situation, and just say, could we be grateful for any of it? Mm. There's usually something. And I always say, if you if you don't learn from some painful experience it likely comes back and you have to go through it in some way, shape or form again, which really sucks. And I don't know why this happens, but when you think about the things that have happened in your life that, you know, it's for me, it was the bad boyfriend. 
Like I had the bad boyfriend over and over and over again. And I would find all the excuses as to why it didn't work out. And this went on for like a good portion of my relationship life. It was just one after until finally I was like, okay, wait, is there a lesson that I'm not learning here? (laughs) What is the common denominator here? (laughs) What's happening here? And it was like, how many men did I have to go through? And for, for me to finally be like, and it, got worse and worse like the breakups were worse and whatever it was more trauma and like it was brutal until finally I was like I need to learn and I actually stopped dating completely for two years because I was like okay I need to figure out what's really going on here Mm -hmm. and I need to heal from whatever's is the emotional stuff that's happening here why I'm attracting these men into my life and it was a serious journey but I came out the other side of it the last man I dated seriously i had to break up with him because it was just not working out it was i thought he was the love of my life i had to break up with him i was devastated and that's i'm on the floor like the darkest moment bawling my eyes out going why can nothing work out like i thought this was it wow. and that's when i kind of broke and it was at the d- darkest place that i broke and i was like i have to heal and i took that two years and i'm now married to that man seven years later <laughs> We got back together. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? Isn't Isn't that that incredible? I I just think that's unbelievable because I think like we resist the pain and getting to that dark place so much. Like we will do anything and it's understandable in one way because psychologically we're, we're wired to recoil from pain. So you put your hand on a hot stove, you're wired to pull away. And we do the same, not just with physical pain, but with emotional pain, we want to run as quickly as possible but it's really important for us to hold ourselves in that place because look at the incredible breakthrough that you had in your life. And I can attest yeah. to the same thing in mine because I didn't run and because I just turned. And I always, always say this, like when it's these situations, the only way out is through and you just have to go through the journey of it. And it's horrible, but out the other side, there is a new beginning. And I think that's the difference is that I, people, Uh, I always held a belief that there was going to be an end of this situation. And even on days where I couldn't imagine life feeling good again, I had a conviction that it would be. And I decided not to give up in the middle because we a lot of times give up in the middle of our story because we think it's the ending, Mm -hmm. but it's never the ending. It's just, you're just stuck. And I think all good stories, they have this like climax where the hero just thinks, there is no way this is ever going to work. Like there is a dead end. And the rest of us as an audience are watching this story thinking, no, just hold on. Or it's just around the corner. But when you're the character in the story, like some reframe that I always tell myself is what if this is just your moment of, you know, the story hasn't finished yet. The redemption hasn't happened yet. Like you actually have to wait to the end of your story and not give up in the middle of it. Yeah, yeah, I agree. <laughs> yeah. I, if for people like you can take comfort and this is what I do with myself is when I'm going through something really crappy where I just think, why is this happening to me? I always tell myself one day I will see why this happened. Yes. And, and I just can take comfort in that. And I, I can still, then I can stay in the depths of my depression or whatever, wherever I'm at. Yes. It's like, it gives me permission to go through the pain while, it, while it's happening because one day I'm going to just, and it just gives me comfort. It's like, no, yeah. one day I'm going to see why I had to go through all of this because it's, I'm going to learn from it. Something's going to happen. Right. Yeah. And I think like, as you were talking, I was thinking like one of the things that adds complexity to this is our society now and the social media, because for some reason our world has decided that like, if we're not happy all the time, something's wrong. Right. Yes. And if we are experiencing quote unquote negative emotions like anger or sadness or grief or any of those sort of things that we need to fix it as quickly as possible because we're scrolling and looking at everyone we know and, and they're happy little life. And they're happy life. And they look perfect. <laughs> Don't they look amazing? They look and amazing. They are not amazing. And they've got <laughs> yes. the perfect kids. <laughs> yes. And they're not sharing the photos of themselves lying on the sofa in their yoga pants with no makeup on. And ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it's important to remind yourself of that, that, you know, there's nothing wrong with feeling not good. Yeah, no, I think that that's, that's so true. It's okay. But then, okay, let's talk about the opposite. What about the people that 
are stuck in their pain that are the cat. It's like, that's part of their identity of who they are, that it's hard for them to get out. What's happening there in the brain? Yeah. I mean, one of the things that I was like very resistant about when I got diagnosed with cancer is I did not want to be known as the girl who had cancer. Like it was just something in me. I saw it as weakness. I don't, it was just a very automatic thing to the point that outside of like close friends and family, I didn't even tell anyone that I was going through cancer because I just didn't want people to be like, Oh, poor Sarah. Yeah. Yeah. And I, in retrospect, I've now realized how positive that was is because I never defined myself by the identity of that. Our identity is, is the core operating place that we, we operate in life from. It's the core foundation that we make all our decisions upon. It's the core way we interact with other people in the world. So if we allow a negative quote unquote diagnosis to change our identity of who we are, we are basically accepting that as going to stay the same for the rest of our life. And we're going to allow it to change our personality. We're going to allow it to change how we operate with other people. And we do that for all sorts of reasons. And it's normally for some kind of a subconscious positive return that we're getting that we're unaware that we're getting and normally when it comes if we're talking physical pain here normally it comes from sympathy or attention sometimes we might be in like interpersonal relationships where the only way we've gotten attention is when we've been in physical pain or maybe we've never felt like we've had sympathy or empathy from other people and so when we've got this all of a sudden our needs are getting filled and so when your needs are getting filled by something that's actually negative diagnosis you're setting yourself up to get very stuck because for you to remove yourself or maybe find an answer or solution to lighten or even eliminate the pain becomes a threat on your identity. And we take, like, psychologically, we take threats to our identity very seriously. So I I think about all the major changes that we go through. Um, One of the biggest psychological changes, like, griefs that someone can go through is the death of a spouse and that's not just because of the love that people have it's because their whole identity for how many of years of their life was known in relation to someone else it's an identity shattering and so for us it's really important that we ask ourselves the question have we connected our identity to something that we would actually like to be transient (laughs) that's not serving us right it's not serving us and even if that's something that has been quote-unquote chronic even if it's something doctors have told you would be forever I still stand by not allowing that to change who you are in your identity Um, and allowing your identity to be framed by the things that are actually going to serve your life moving forward. Mm -hmm. I've worked with a lot of women who realize during our journey working together that they hold on to weight because it's how they identify with themselves. And that's a really tough one because they get to a certain point where they're losing the weight, they're losing the weight, and it starts to, and and subconsciously it starts freaking them out and they start to self-sabotage. And then we have to go through the, okay, well, why is this happening? I worked with one woman. It was like, she got lots of attention from her, you know, being sick all the time and being tired and she had something to complain about. And she, she realized this all on her own as we were talking together. It was like her identity was wrapped around. And, but if you've spent your whole life thinking about your weight and thinking about the food you're putting in your mouth, that's your identity then. Absolutely. Right. And exactly what you shared is so true. We self-sabotage to get back because... To get back to most, the familiarity. Yeah, to get back to an equilibrium because psychologically our brain, we think our brain is working for us. It's not. Our brain is working for our safety. That's it. It wants us yes. to stay safe all of the time. And so most of our um, processes in our brain are automatic so how we operate I think it's like 95% of our thoughts we think are the same every day and operate like we pretty much do the same thing over and over again and so when we do things that are outside of that we stretch our comfort zone we change the way we're eating or exercising or our weight we change even how much money we're earning change anything to do outside of that equilibrium our brain goes into threat the same kind of fight flight freeze response and it's looking for anything to eliminate the stressor and so if we identify the stressor as oh well the the stressor is just my weight loss like if I just put that weight back on this 
sense of insecurity or threat will disappear. It does for the, yeah. for, the, for a while until you then wake up and go, oh, but now I'm not, I'm not, you know, losing the weight that I wanted to lose or my end goal isn't what I wanted it to be. And so we have to be really cognizant of what our brain is telling us. And this is where it's really important to separate ourselves from our thoughts your brain can go crazy. Like yeah. <laughs> sometimes I'll say to myself, like, Sarah, your brain is going crazy today, but I know that I'm not my thoughts. I can have heaps of thoughts, sound crazy, make me sound like a crazy woman, but I don't have to believe every single thing I think. I can just watch them as thoughts run through my head and then let them go. And this is where it's really important that we don't latch on and think, well, if I'm thinking this about myself, it must mean that I am this. Yes. Yes. And that's my, or that's my identity. I, I heard from one of my favorite guys, Jim Fortin. You might know him. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And he says, you're the thinker of your thoughts. And I was like, oh, okay. It's like, it puts the power back in your cord. It's like, well, yeah. then change your thoughts. Right. But then you have to be, then you have to become aware of your thoughts, which is very challenging. Like I said, so we're on autopilot all the time. But it yes. is possible. You can change those thoughts when you become aware of those thoughts. Absolutely. And awareness is always 80%. And so I think if there's an area in your life that you're wanting to change and that you're aware that you might need to shift your identity, one of the best things you can do is like do a brain dump of every single thought that's running around in your head about that specific area on a piece of paper um, and when you can actually see it written out in black and white, you, you, it creates a sense of separation from it and gives oh, you a great. sense of like, this is not who I am. This is just something that's going around in my head. And then you can ask yourself the question, are the thoughts on this page right now actually going to serve me into this new change of identity that I want to make? Or are these the actual reasons that I'm repeating certain behaviors over and over again? Right. Yeah. And I guess that's why it's just so hard for us to make changes in our lives as women mm. like when we're wanting like I always say I, women the women I attract into my office and into my you know who listens to this podcast are women that are going through this phase in their life where you know the kids are grown up or maybe they're old enough that they don't need them anymore you know they're physically going through a change because maybe perimenopause hormones are happening you know mm. they've they've decided whether or not they're going to keep the husband or get rid of them. <laughs> like those things have all kind of been taken care of and those priorities have now shifted to them, to themselves. And it's, mm. I see that they really want to make changes. It's like this underlying theme with so many women that I work with where they're, they want to make change and they want to do something that they've always maybe wanted to do and never did. And it's like, it starts to show up and manifest physically painfully, yeah. you know, whether it's, you know, a sore back or putting on some weight or whatever it is. And it's like, what, what could you tell these women that are wanting to make these shifts, make these changes? I think that brain dump is an excellent one. Do you have any other tools just to help people to take that, to get the courage to move forward? Yeah, I think awareness is, is definitely the first point of the process because otherwise we psychologically create or life attracts into us enough pain until we make the decision. And so a lot of times we don't make change until not making change becomes more painful. And so if you can become, become very aware and kind of awaken in your own life, you can eliminate some of that because, you know, the, what you're describing there for a lot of times women have put themselves on the back burner for yes, years, you know, and so the discovery of how they really feel for some women the discovery of, you know, what's their favorite flowers to receive or what, what do they actually like to eat? You know, they really so disconnected from who they are because they've been in service to other people that can even and of itself be a huge process. And so I am a huge advocate of journaling. Yeah. Not in just the sense of like a dear diary. Um, you can keep it if you want to, but it's very much a, allowing your soul and your mind to have an outlet in your brain. There's a part of your brain called the prefrontal cortex that can only hold like three to seven thoughts at one time. And if you don't write things out on paper or on your computer, <laughs> um, it will loop the same thoughts over and over again so that you don't forget them. If, if your brain believes it to be important. So if there's some things that you've been thinking about, if you are not regularly and on a daily basis, writing them out 
unedited, unscripted, not worried about what, like this journal needs to be something that no one else is ever going to see. Um, it, you don't even need to keep it if you don't want to, but it's your opportunity to get everything out onto a page and begin to do that as a regular practice. You will begin to become aware of what's actually number one, most important to you. And number two, what might actually be holding you back because you'll begin to notice yourself having, we all have patterns of yeah. sabotage or the way that we operate within ourselves and and over time you begin to see hang on didn't i have that same thought process about this other thing that happened and now i'm doing it again and and it just wakes you up to how you're being in the world so i would really encourage everyone people have resistance to journaling i think because they think it's like this dear diary like today i yeah. went to the shops <laughs> so i more like see it as an unedited um, description of all the thoughts running around your head. It doesn't have to make sense. It can start with like, today is sunny outside and this person's annoying me. And having just like that real raw place where you can be honest is like hugely important and game changing. Yeah. Have you heard of that book where I think it's called pages or something, or you do your pages? Like, have you heard about this? And it's for people um, with ADD or something? No, I haven't. Oh, Oh, I wish I could remember what it was called. Oh, it's like, it's just well, that, that idea where you wake up every morning and you're not allowed to pre-think anything. It's a brain wow. dump and you just, you write nonstop for a set amount of time. And it's, yes. you, it's, it's un, like exactly what you're talking about. And it's yeah. like a journal for it. I wish wow. I that is so ever. interesting. I know. There you go. Get that journal. That I know. I'm going to try and think about it. I'm going to look for it in the show yes. notes. And hopefully <laughs> I find what it is. I yeah. just remember this guy telling me he called it his pages. So I don't know if that's what the book was oh, called wow. or if that's what it was called. Yeah. I have yeah. heard about it in creative writing, you know, about allowing that kind of subconscious to get out on the page before you start your creative work. I've heard about it in that context. I've heard about it in terms of there's a lot of studies um, where, and this is reverting back to dealing with pain again, where there was this one study that I found really interesting. There was a group of women who were diagnosed with breast cancer and they, 50% of the women, they told them, you, you know, process this negative event however you want emotionally. For a lot of them, they tried not to think about it. And for this other group, they were told they had to journal about their diagnosis and about how they were feeling every day for like three months. And interestingly, this group that had to do the journaling initially went through almost more negative emotions than the other group. They initially had higher symptoms of anxiety and depression than this other group. But at the two year mark, they were so significantly higher in their coping, their purpose, their fulfillment, their happiness than this wow. other group, that it was so substantial that these researchers were actually really surprised. And so that's another thing with journaling. You know, it's just like, I'm sure what you teach with um, health and weight loss, sometimes we're looking for this like crazy new invention. Um, like yes. who would have thought writing your feelings? <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> But it's true. Sometimes, you know, it feels weird to do and it. it can feel vulnerable, especially if you're worried if other people were to see it. But to try and do that on a regular basis is really going to help you. Yeah, just get a little lock diary or something or burn it after you, after yes. you write it. Shred it all out. Like, <laughs> shred it. Yeah, exactly. What have you got to do? Eliminate yeah. it afterwards so you don't have to worry about it. I do that often. I'll, I'll write something down and then I don't want someone to read it. So I put it in my wood stove and... Yes. Done. <laughs> so good. Uh, so you have, I was looking on your blog, of course, and yeah. you have a great little um, free gift. Yes. Reframe your brain. Nine most powerful questions to get perspective in a difficult situation. So yeah. before we go, I just want to go over a couple of these, and then I would encourage everybody to go uh, subscribe to her email list so that you can get the rest of them because these are great. So um, these are, so when something, a situation is happening, right? Like, or yes. something bad or you're in pain or you're going through something that's, you know, hardship. Um, your question was, was, what is the good within the bad situation? Yes. That's great. What is interesting about this situation? So if you can't find something good, could you find something interesting, right? Yes, because <laughs> curiosity is actually an emotion that is hard to coexist. You'll actually find when you ask good questions like this, it's like your brain almost goes into this other zone of like, what? What? Yes. Curious. 
And, it, and because of that, you're actually almost malfunctioning the circuits that automatically run. And that's why these questions are great because you just think, oh, wow, that actually makes me intentionally think about it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I love that. Um, what would I do if I wasn't scared? Mm. I do that one all. I ask that my, to myself all the time. What could be the meaning within the greater purpose or pain? Which is definitely what you had to find, isn't it? My, yeah. Myself too. And, you know, these are things that can, like she said, it can pull you out of the misery, of the depression, even momentarily, just to give you a different perspective on what's happening in that moment. And I think that that's so important. I always do, like for the last couple of years, when I realized I could change my own brain, I can change my thoughts. I've been on this mission to kind of challenge myself almost about how fast can I change my emotions yeah. in, a, wow. in, a, in a not such great situation, right? If something yeah. happens to me physically, emotionally, financially, whatever it is, I, you know, I, I'm going through that pain and I, now I try and not go through it for too long. I try and get through it as fast as I can in the sense of, okay, I'm going to go through this, but then I'm moving on. And it's like, how fast can I, I change my perception, perception of what just happened? That's so good because you, you're really, what you're doing is you're training your brain to, I mean, I just did a rhyme there, guys. You're training <laughs> your brain to reframe. There you go. There we go. We're going to start <laughs> rapping now. <laughs> because like, it's all those little moments where you're reframing even smaller situations and medium situations that when you do come into big situations in your life, you've developed that mental strength. I always use the same example as if you go into a gym, you've never done weights before and you walk up to the heaviest weight there is. It's going to be a huge struggle for you to go through that situation or lift that weight. But if you've been regularly lifting smaller weights and medium weights, when something massive happens in your life, you're going to have that mental reserve and that emotional reserve to deal with it. Yeah. And so a big part of your mission now is not only teaching women this, but teaching women so that we can also teach our children and you're yes. teaching children resilience, which I think is just unbelievable. So tell us a little bit about that business. Yeah. So we, I started Resilient Little Hearts uh, maybe a year ago, and it's really a movement to teach children these concepts of resilience and courage and kindness and all of these mental and emotional coping skills. I just know I've got two young children myself, and I just know from everything that I've been through, they are growing up in a very different world than we're growing up in. And yeah. I believe that the tools that we're talking about today are fundamental to positive coping in life, but I also know they're going to be even more fundamental in the next generation. Yeah. And so I'm really passionate about equipping children with these tools. And one of the main ways that we do that is through story um, because, you know, children don't want to get sat in a conference room and told about mindset practices. <laughs> um, Here's how you be positive. Yeah, this is You're like the thinker of your thoughts, kids. <laughs> don't forget. <laughs> <laughs> and so, yeah, I'm, I'm in the, like, uh, we're releasing, I'm releasing a whole children's book series around oh, wow. resilience and courage. And so we've already got our first one, um, out. It's, uh, about courage. It's called the boy who stood up tall. And it's really about reframing what courage is, what bravery is, how we can stand up to our fears. Um, and so with every book, so with this first one, there's also a parenting pack, um, and digital download uh, where they can understand how to support their children through fear. And so our whole um, movement, I suppose, is about supporting the parent and actually giving the child resource so that as they grow up, they've got these foundations to come back to. Great. And, and for us women and mothers, what better way to teach your kid by leading by example? Absolutely. Right. Oh, and that's the biggest thing with parenting. I get a lot of questions in, in that other business that I run, you know, how can I help my child? And at the end of the day, if you can't do anything else, the most influential thing you can do is to example and be an example of these benefits. If you want your child to be courageous, you need to be courageous. Yeah. If you want your child to be resilient, you need to be resilient. And really taking these principles to heart yourself because they're watching you and they're watching they're watching you more than they're listening to you sometimes. Oh, all the 100%. time, actually. Yes, all the time. Well, you just think about like, have you not many times in your life been like, oh my gosh, I'm so like one of your, like, oh, I'm so, I'm, I'm always yeah. like, oh, I'm just like my mom. Jeez. Yes, totally. <laughs> and you do those mom lectures where you yeah, think yeah. I'm getting my point across and no one's listening. <laughs> uh, I'm just like my mom. Yeah. <laughs> 
so true. Well, Sarah, this has been awesome. I really appreciate talking to you. I think you've really hit home on so many great topics here. And I know that so many of the listeners are going to get so much in this conversation. So thank you so much. Oh, thank you, Karen. I've loved it. I've loved chatting about it. And yeah, it'd be great. It's been so good talking with, um, hearing more about like what you do as well, because I mean, you gave a gift to me. I didn't even know that about the thyroid and stuff. So thank you. Yeah, You're going to have to look into that. I am. Yes. And Louise Hay. Oh, I have heard her. Yes. Yeah. So anytime that you have sickness, pain, anything, just look up whatever it is like back pain and Louise Hay. She's going to tell you. She's going to tell me. I'm going to look it up. (laughs) Thanks, Anne-Louise. Hey. Yeah. (laughs) All right. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, Karen.